Welcome to the Church on the Hill Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from our Sunday morning service. If you have any questions about the message or about the church, or would like to know more about who we are, please feel free to contact our church office through the contact information located here on the website. It's a wonderful day to be in the presence of the Lord. Um, I loved that Lynette shared her, her testimony because it's encouraging and it reminds us why we, why we stick with all of the battles. It reminds us why we fight everything. It, demi- it reminds us that God is faithful, that God is on our side, that we are never by ourselves and we are never, ever alone. Um, so that's just really awesome, and that's just what's still in my heart and my spirit is just celebrating that amazing, amazing testimony. Um, so we're going to get started this morning, and we're actually going to be in the book of Luke, and we're going to be in Luke 19, if my Bible will cooperate with me. Um, <clears throat> this is a passage, this is a story that We learn about if we grow up in church, we hear about it a lot. If you're like me, you learned about this story because you sang in kids' church a lot, um, because you always sing about Zacchaeus and his little tree, and that's pretty much where we leave it. So we're going to get back to that in a second. But how many of you have ever felt in our world or our society that there is a status or there is a picture or there is something you're supposed to match or meet up to. I like people to respond when I speak, (laughs) in case you're wondering. Um, There is, our world just gives this natural feel that there is a textbook version of normal that you're supposed to fit into. It's just, We're never really told it. It's not taught really in school. Nobody ever says those specific words, but we're always made to feel there's like a status of normal that you're supposed to match. When I was growing up in our home, the status of normal was that you were required, specifically me, when we came to church, I was required to be still, I was required to be quiet. That was expected. That was normal. You look like you're supposed to look. You wear your little, me, I wore my little dress and we had to wear little shoes and the socks with the lace on it. We were very, I was very girly. Um, I still am. But there was an expectation of what I was supposed to be. I was not supposed to play and twirl on the front row. I got in trouble a lot in church because I thought I should be able to play and twirl in the middle of church on the front row. I got in trouble a lot. But there was an expectation put on me of what I was supposed to behave like. Our world naturally, and that expectation for church was not a bad thing for me. I probably would have run amok if I didn't have that. But in our world, we have this expectation that's put on us. Be normal. First of all, what is normal? There is no such thing. Um, One of our youth leaders, Crystal, she spoke a couple Wednesday nights ago, and she, in her message, was telling us, And I laugh all the time when she does this, that she calls her kids weird. She tells them they're weird because she doesn't want them to ever be comfortable being normal or to try to fit in because they need to be normal. She wants them comfortable to be different. And so that got me thinking and there's this expectation We're supposed to look a certain way. We're supposed to make a certain amount of money. We're supposed to have a certain kind of house and a certain lifestyle and do certain things. And our life is supposed to look like this little textbook version of normal. We're supposed to look normal. We're all supposed to look the same. Don't be weird. Don't be different. That's what we tell kids. Why are you being weird? Why are you going to wear that? You look weird. Like, 
I don't understand where that comes from. Because basically what we're telling people is don't be yourself, conform, and be like everyone else. That's, that's what we're saying. And the story that we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna talk about a guy in the Bible that was not afraid to be a little bit different. He just was different. He had a profession that nobody liked. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. And in the Bible days, nobody liked them. They were known for cheating people. They were known for stealing. They were known for lying about stuff. They came, they took all your money. No one liked his profession. So by his profession, Zacchaeus is already on the outside. Then on top of that, the Bible tells us that Zacchaeus is incredibly short. I am not a tall person. And so when you're short, you're naturally always behind people and you're always behind the really, really tall people for some reason. And Zacchaeus is always in the background. So nobody likes him because of his job. On top of that, nobody really pays attention to him because they just kind of overlook him because he's short and he can't really be seen. And so they just kind of shove him off to the side. So he comes up in our story and it says in the beginning of Luke 19, it says, Jesus entered and walked through Jericho. And it says there was a man there and his name was Zacchaeus. He was the head tax man and he was quite rich. So he's not even just a tax collector. He's in charge of all of the tax collectors in this town. So he's probably really not liked. So the norm of the people that gather to meet Jesus automatically don't like Zacchaeus. He doesn't fit their mold. He doesn't fit their expectation. He doesn't fit anything that they think he's supposed to be. Because it even goes on in a little bit, and we'll get to it, that he doesn't meet the expectation of these people that claim to be Christians. They don't even deem him worthy of being a Christian because he doesn't fit with them. So as the story goes on, it talks about, and it says, he desperately wanted to see Jesus, but the crowd was in his way because he was a very short man and he couldn't see over the crowd. So let's talk about Zacchaeus for a few minutes. He's, he really wants to see Jesus. It doesn't really tell us why. It doesn't tell us that um, he served God his whole life and he just desperately wanted to be saved. It could be that, but it also could be Jesus was like the most popular thing in this day and he was the thing to be seen. So it could have been just Zacchaeus was nosy and really wanted to see and really wanted to know what all the fuss was about. It doesn't tell us. It just tells us that he desperately wanted to see Jesus. So in this moment, Zacchaeus knows he's short. He knows that he's not gonna be able to push through the crowd because they don't really like him, so they're not really gonna let him come in front like, oh yeah, you're short, here. Stand here so you can see Jesus. So he does something that was very undignified for men in this day and age. He climbs a tree in the crowd to see Jesus. The reason it was not acceptable for men to do that in the Bible days was because of the clothing they wore. They all wore like dress things. They didn't wear pants, they wore dresses. So it was very inappropriate. It was very uncomfortable and you just didn't do that. But he did it anyway. He took a risk and he climbs a sycamore tree just so he can see Jesus. He doesn't try to talk to him. He literally just wants to see him. So he's bold enough to do this. 
We're gonna pause there for a second. Zacchaeus could have said, nobody likes me. I'm short, I'm not gonna be able to see anyway. I'm just not gonna go. It's gonna be too much work. It's gonna be too much effort. He could have gotten there and said, "Mm, I can't see. I don't feel like climbing a tree today. I'm not supposed to. So I'm just gonna go home. He would have missed out on his whole blessing that he got. He would have missed out on a life-changing experience. Sometimes that happens in our lives is when we get in our life, when we get in our Christian walk, things get a little rocky and things get a little rough. I really wanna sleep in today. I don't really wanna go to church tonight. I really don't wanna get up early and read my Bible. Or you know what, I I got home from work late The kids had a ton of homework. We just ate dinner. It's like 10 o'clock at night. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. I'll read tomorrow. That happens a lot in our Christian walk. We justify things instead of having that unbridled passion of, you know what? It doesn't matter what it costs me. It doesn't matter what I have to do. I want to spend time with Jesus. In this moment, Zacchaeus risks his entire reputation and what's left of it anyway, just so he can see Jesus. And sometimes in our Christian walk, we don't want to risk that the person at work might think we're weird if we offer to pray for them. Or if we talk about our church, they might think we're one of those weird Christian people. I might not fit the status of norm if I really live out my convictions because I might have to say, I don't believe in going there. I don't do that. I don't talk like that. I don't listen to that kind of music. You might have to risk your reputation a little bit to say, you know what, I'm not good with that because the God that I serve doesn't go that way. You might have to risk your reputation a little bit You might have to say, I'm willing to be not normal and to be a little bit uncomfortable in order to find God. God's not always going to keep you in this little happy bubble world where you're 100% comfortable the entire time. I'm pretty sure the disciples were never comfortable. Pretty sure Jesus was never comfortable. Anything that's worth the risk is going to take a little bit of effort and it's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. How many of you have ever climbed a tree? I think I climbed a tree like once. It didn't go well. Um, It's not easy depending on the type of tree you're climbing. It really wouldn't be easy in a really long dress and robe. But Zacchaeus does it anyway because he so desperately wants to see Jesus. He just wants to see him. When was the last time that you risked everything just because you wanted to see God? Just because you wanted to be in his presence? Just because you wanted to feel him for just a second? If it involved risking everything, your reputation, your life, your fortune, your everything, would you still step out and say, I want to see Jesus. I want to go there and see him. If it was going to cost you everything. Because that's what Zacchaeus is doing in this moment. He's risking everything. So as the story goes on, in about verse five, it says, when Jesus got there, he looked up and he said by name, Zacchaeus, hurry down. Today is my day to be a guest at your home. This guy just climbed a tree to see Jesus. And Jesus walks by and notices Zacchaeus and knows him by name and calls him out and says, get down. I'm going to go to your house today. 
So what Jesus is doing is publicly, Jesus is giving Zacchaeus that stamp of approval. And saying, you, I pick you. I'm gonna go be with you today. Because you're who I choose. Sometimes we need to remember this part that says, that's very small and simple, that says Jesus knew him by name. We need to remember Jesus knows us by name. He watches us and he walks with us and he sees us in the private moments, in the public moments, in all of them. He's right there and he knows you by name. And I would venture to say that in every life in this room, multiple times, Jesus has probably come by and called you by name. The challenge is, were you listening? And did you hear it? Or were you a little too busy trying to fit into the norm to hear the voice of Jesus? Jesus knows you by name. You're not forgotten. You're not one of the masses. Because Jesus looks at you and he says, you're important enough for me to know you by your name. And then the part about Jesus says, he just invites him to his house. The very Southern manners that I was taught growing up was you didn't do that. You didn't just invite yourself to someone's house and say, I'm coming over. I was, when I grew up, that was like, you didn't do that. You did that with like family and like super, super close friends occasionally. But you didn't just invite yourself over to people's houses. And Jesus does. I don't know if that was against etiquette rules in Bible days. I don't know if they had etiquette rules in Bible days. I don't know. But I know Jesus just looks at him and says, I'm coming to your house. Today, get down. Come on, let's go. I'm ready. Are you ready when Jesus calls? Zacchaeus was ready. He climbed down instantly and they went. When Jesus calls you out and says, let's go, we're, we're moving, let's go. Are you listening enough to hear? Do you have your eyes set on Jesus enough that when he says, let's move, let's go, that your answer is yes, okay, we're moving. Or do you sit in the tree for a while? Uh, my house isn't clean. <laughs> if it's my house, it's never clean. <laughs> Specifically mine. I didn't make any lunch today. I didn't go to the grocery. Uh, I really want to go here on Tuesday. So can we not do that, Jesus? Can we do that maybe next week? I'll talk to them next week. I want to go to lunch right now. Do you have those conversations with God? Or when Jesus points out somebody, go talk to them. Is your answer, yeah, okay. And you put down what you're doing and you pick up and you go talk to them. Or do you say, mm, I really have to finish this. You understand work comes first. This is not an excuse to stop doing homework. Don't get up and leave class. That's just for the parents. <laughs> Are you ready when Jesus says, get down, let's go? Are you paying enough attention that when Jesus comes to you and he says, hey, I wanna spend time with you. Are you too busy to spend time with him? I've gotta get the kids to bed. I've gotta clean the house. I've gotta to go to the grocery store. I've gotta do this, I've gotta do that. I'll spend time with you in a minute, Lord. Or I'll talk to you on the way to the grocery store. I'll talk to you while I'm grocery shopping. That's not true, nobody really does that. Unless it's like, help me not to buy that, help me not to buy that. Are we paying enough attention to the Lord that when he says, I want to spend time with you, that we say, okay, let's go. 
Zacchaeus climbed down instantly. The very next statement is this. It says, after Jesus says, today is my day to be a guest at your home, it says Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree, hardly believing his good luck, delighted to take Jesus to his home with him. And then the very next statement says, everyone who saw this was indignant and grump. And they said, what business does he have hanging out with a crook? This is something I want to talk about for a minute. How many times do we do that? Why would God speak to them? Why is God going to move in their life? They don't belong in church. They don't look like they belong in church. That goes back to the norm. There is no church normal. If you look like Jesus, great. That's what you're supposed to look like. Other than that, there's no picture of normal or perfect. It's something we've labeled and said, this is what we expect of you. When all God says is love me, spend time with me. These people lose out on a blessing because instead of being overjoyed that the guy that handles literally all of the money in their town and being overjoyed with the fact that he's going to get saved and he's going to meet with Jesus, instead of being excited, they're grumpy and jealous and indignant. I can't believe he's talking to him. Doesn't he know who he is? That said a lot about Jesus. Doesn't he know who he's talking to? Yes. That goes back to our status of norm and what we think normal is and what we think we're supposed to measure up to. Nobody put those expectations on us. We so many times put those expectations on ourselves of I'm not good enough for God to speak to me. I'm not good enough to hear from God. I'm not good enough to serve. I'm not good enough to be used. These kind of stories in the Bible remind us that Jesus picks you by what your heart looks like, not by what the outside of you looks like. The Lord sees past the things that define you. You need to remember that God knows your name. And more than knowing your name, he knows the condition of your heart. That could be good or bad, depending on where you sit with God. Because God sees in your heart. So if you come to this church and you worship and it's all about, ooh, look, they're looking at me while I'm worshiping. God sees that. The condition of your heart matters. Because it's your heart that is in constant conversation with the heart of God. Zacchaeus' heart was so open and so humble and so ready and so excited that he jumped out of the tree and couldn't wait to bring Jesus to his house. It talks about that he was humbled. The story goes on and Zacchaeus' response to Jesus is, look, if I have stolen anything, I'll give back, I think it says 10 times what I've stolen. And if I've cheated anybody, I think that's the way it goes. If I've cheated anybody, he says, master, I will give half of my income to the poor. And if I'm caught cheating, I will pay four times the damage. This speaks to the heart of Zacchaeus. He's so humbled that God would be with him. He doesn't want to make a mistake. But he says, Lord, if I do make a mistake, if I have made a mistake, look, if I make a mistake from this forward, this is my promise. This is what I'm going to do. Talks about that Zacchaeus and his whole house came to salvation that day. You hear that a lot in the Bible and salvation came to the whole household, and salvation came to the whole household. It's not just because in this day and age, men were the head of the household. 
It's because when one person in a home and when one person in a workplace and when one person in a school gets truly set on fire for God, salvation will come to wherever they are because we're called to bring it with us when we go. Because if we're not keeping our eyes so set on Jesus that when we walk into a room, salvation and healing and the full presence of God come with us, then we're not keeping our eyes and our life in line with the right place. Because I can promise you, if we're so focused on the norm and fitting into the things around us, we will never fit into the God that created us. We're not designed or called to fit into this world. In Romans 12, verse one and two, it talks about don't copy the behaviors and the customs of this world. Other translations say, be not conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You're not supposed to fit here in this world if you're really part of God. Maybe the real thing is if the world doesn't think you're weird and a little bit odd, maybe things aren't right. We're called to be whoever God created us to be. We're not called to please the people around us or fit in with the people around us. We're called to live a life that is sold out with God. You know, when Zacchaeus is told as a children's story, it's told as a song of he climbed a tree and Jesus said, come to my house. And that's where they leave it. When in reality, we need to be a little bit more like Zacchaeus. We need to be willing to risk everything just to see God. We need to remember that we're not supposed to be focused on fitting in with the normal part of this world, but we're called to fit in with God. We need to keep our eyes so set on him that the moment he says, get out of the tree, come on, let's go. This is what we're gonna do today. Our answer is, Okay, yes. Your answer might be, okay, yes, I'm terrified. I have no idea what we're doing. You don't have to know the plan. God knows the plan. And then we have to remember to be humble enough that the Lord can poke out our faults because that's what Zacchaeus is doing in this last minute when he says, Look, I'll give away half my income to the poor. If I've cheated anybody, I'll give four times what I've stolen. What he's doing is he's putting himself in a place of openness and humility with Jesus to say, tell me if I'm wrong. I wanna be open, I wanna be humble. If I don't do something right, please tell me, I wanna fix it. So many times we come to church and we want God to move in our life and we want to celebrate the good things and we want God to do miracles for us because we need God when we're uncomfortable or when bad things happen. But when life is good, we don't want God getting in our mess because he might mess up our life. He might make me a little bit uncomfortable. So what happens is we then begin to pick and choose the situations and the portions of our heart and our life that God gets involved in. Because then we're dividing up our heart and our life. God, you can have this piece and you can have this piece and you can have this piece, but yeah, this relationship, it's not going anywhere because I really want to keep it. You don't want me working here, but I don't really see a different plan, so I'm going to stay working here. You can just move around it. Or I'm really uncomfortable going up to the altar to get prayer. So God, if you really want to do something in my life, you can talk to me from here. That heart says I'm not really willing to risk everything. Because sometimes it takes, okay, God, I'm not ready to walk up to the front yet, but I am going to stand up 
And I am going to take a few steps forward and I am going to raise my hand and I am going to say, God, I need you. God will meet you wherever you are. I met Zacchaeus at a tree. We need to stop thinking that we're fighting our battles by ourselves. We need to stop thinking that we're just one of the masses that gets ignored and I'm dealing with my issues and my problems on my own and God really doesn't know about them because if he really did, he'd care. He does care. He's ready to get in the middle of your mess. He's ready to fix it. He's ready to heal it. But so many times we give him our mess and then five minutes later we take it back because we'd really like to fix it for him. And the Lord says, I just want to love on you. Why don't you let me love on you? Because I can promise you, as you just open yourself to the full presence of God and you say, you know what, Lord? I just, I don't know. I don't know. I can promise you, if you just say, Lord, I want to be loved by you. I just want to see you. When the Lord invades and you let the Lord love on you and he gets into every crack and every crevice of your heart, your life will change because the love of God transforms every single thing it touches. In the book of John, it talks about how perfect love casts out fear. In this moment, when Zacchaeus' name is called, he knows he's loved. Because he knows, ooh, I'm important to somebody. He knows me. And then Jesus goes to his house, and that's even further cemented into who he is. Because when you spend personal time with Jesus, you are permanently changed and marked by the presence of God. Because when you really meet God, you can try to go back to your old life, but it will never work out. Because it's, you've tasted and experienced something so beautiful and so pure and so perfect that it changes who you are. As the worship team comes, we're going to close And what I want to move into for just a little bit is I don't know where you sit in your life with God. You and God know. Your heart, your mind, you know where you and God stand. But I can promise you that the Lord today is calling you by name. Whether you have faithfully served him your entire life of 50 billion years, no one's that old, or you've served him not even two minutes, it doesn't matter. The Lord is still calling you by name and saying, come spend time with me. You're important to me. You matter to me. Focus on me. Not on our world, not on our society, not on what the entire world wants to tell you to fix, to change, to be like this, to be like that. Focus on me. Maybe you feel like God has let you down. Maybe because of life and circumstances, you feel like God left you, abandoned you, or betrayed you. That's okay to feel like that. Maybe you're angry at God. That's okay. His shoulders are big enough to handle whatever you're carrying. But the way that you handle it is you come to God and you say, okay, Lord, I'm mad at you. You failed me in this moment because this is what I expected you to do. 
This is the moment I expected you to show up and to change something and to deliver me and to do a miracle and to do this. And she got a miracle and I didn't and I'm angry. You need to do business with God. Because when you're honest about what you feel, that's when the Lord can work. And that's when the Lord comes in and says, I know you're angry and it's okay. Let me love you. Just sit with me and let my presence and let my love melt away all of that junk that you've carried for way too long. Maybe you just feel like you can't find him anymore. Maybe you feel, maybe you're just kind of coasting because you know God is real, you serve him, you love him. You just don't really, you just can't find it anymore. Lord's calling you by name today. And he's saying, come to my house. Come on, get down. I wanna come meet with you. God will meet you wherever you are if you're paying attention. You're not forgotten. You're not alone. You're not ignored by the masses. The Lord looks at you today and he says, you're valuable and you're important and you're the one I chose. just wants to be with you today. Maybe the Lord's poking at other stuff in your life. Maybe you're not Zacchaeus in this story. Maybe you're one of the other people. Maybe you're the one poking at people. I don't know. But I can promise that if you do business with God, he'll fix you too. He didn't throw out the masses because they didn't like Zacchaeus. Trust the presence of God. We're gonna just worship for a little bit. If the prayer teams wanna come and take their place, I think we have a prayer team. <laughs> the altars are gonna be open. We have two prayer teams. We're going to open the altars. I'm gonna encourage you with God today. Maybe you just need to come and sit in this altar because you've never done that before and you literally just want to see what it feels like when you sit in his presence. Test God.